Welcome back to Empowered, the amazing church of Jesus Christ. My name is Kelly Rickman, and I'm so excited to continue this journey with you through the book of Acts today. Today, we will be in chapters 10 through 12. A few years back, my son Harrison, who is 10, decided to put his faith in Jesus. And just last year, he decided that he wanted to be baptized. And you can imagine we were so excited. He said that he hoped that his dad would be able to baptize him. So just last fall, we were so excited to gather with family and friends to celebrate and congratulate Harrison on his decision to follow Jesus. But he said a couple of things after that were really surprising to us. He said that as his dad was lifting him up out of the water, it felt like the Holy Spirit was lifting him up. And as his dad gave him a big bear hug, it felt like the Holy Spirit was hugging him. And I just love that Harrison could sense the presence of God even in his baptism at age 10. And he said that it truly was one of the best days of his life. And as we continue to go through the book of Acts today, we are going to see more and more people choosing to put their faith in Jesus and want to be baptized. And we see that at all of these baptisms, there will be great celebration. Now, as we journey through the book of Acts, I want us to notice that the church is expanding. The church is growing. God has lit his church on fire with a flame that is continuing to burn brighter and stronger every single day. But before we dive into our text today, I want to point us to a verse that's kind of a current status of the church in that time, and it's found in Acts 9, 31. And it says this, So the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. It continued to increase. So we see that the church is increasing, but how is it increasing? It said that the people were going on in the fear of the Lord. Now, God-fearers is not a word that we use often in our modern-day language. What does it mean to be a God-fearer, someone who fears God? At first glance, fear makes us think that someone might be afraid, like they were afraid of God, that he might notice their actions and want to discipline them in a really harsh way. But this is not it at all. The people who were God-fearers had a reverence and an awe for the holiness and the righteousness of God, and they wanted to so align their lives with the, the commands and the teachings of God so that they could follow him wholeheartedly. And so we are going to see today that there are some God-fearers in our story, and we don't want to miss their stories as well. Now, Oswald Chambers says, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. And I want us to think about that for a minute because we really do want to consider, are we God fearers personally? Are we fearing God in a reverent way that we have aligned our lives with the teachings and commands of Jesus and we want to walk with him in obedience every day of our lives? Now, as we begin in study one today in Acts chapter 10, verses one through 21, we are going to see a vision from heaven. We will be looking today at the amazing story of Peter and also a man named Cornelius. But turning the first corner, we are going to see that there is a problem. And the problem has to deal with Jews and Gentiles and their interactions with each other. Now, what would their interactions between Jews and Gentiles have been like in those days? We want to recognize that Jews did not like Gentiles, and Gentiles did not like Jews. They didn't have each other over for dinner in their homes, and they didn't congregate in the streets to hang out together. It looked more like hate than anything else that we can think of, but that story is about to change. Today, there is going to be a seismic shift of epic proportions as God is about to do something brand new that he has never done before. Now we know that it has always been in the plan of God from the very beginning of time all the way back to Genesis 17 with the covenant with Abraham that Jesus, the Messiah, this seed would be a blessing to all the families of the world and not just to the Israelite families. And I love the verse in Isaiah 43, 18, which says this, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I love that God is about to show us a new thing that he has never done before. You see, in the story of God up to this point, all families outside of the nation of Israel had been left out of the family of God, completely left out. But that is about to drastically change. But before this shift can come, a huge shift in Peter's thinking is going to have to come about. R. Kent Hughes says in his commentary on Acts, 
Peter had bound all the peoples of the world, except his own race, into a loathsome bundle. God used a vision to bring a radical change in the attitude of the leading apostle of the early church, and it was a good thing he did. Otherwise, Christianity would have been reduced to a narrow sect of Judaism, and you and I would have never heard the good news. The implications for Gentiles today is truly incredible. So God is going to reveal his plan today using two visions. The first vision to a man named Cornelius and the second vision to Peter. Now in chapter 10, verse 1, we meet Cornelius and he is a Gentile. He is a centurion, a Roman centurion stationed in Caesarea, which is about 35 miles north of Joppa. And scripture shows us a few amazing things about Cornelius that we don't want to miss. Scripture says that he was a devout man who feared God. He was generous, giving alms to the poor, and he cared for others. Not only that, but he was a great man of prayer, and Scripture says he prayed continually. You see, Cornelius was a man who wanted to please God with his life, but something we have to note is Cornelius did not understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was not yet a Jesus follower, and he did not have the Holy Spirit guiding his life. So what happened next is truly incredible. On a certain day around noon, Cornelius has a vision. An angel came to him and it was completely alarming. And this angel said, God has been paying attention to, his, to your life. He has noticed your many prayers and the way that you are generous with the people. And this is what I want you to do, Cornelius. Grab three men and send them to Joppa to find a man named Peter, and he will come back to your house to give you a message directly from me. And it just turns out that this message would be a message of salvation. So what did, what did Cornelius do? He gathered two of his servants and one guard and sent them on their way, the 35-mile trek down to Joppa to find Peter. Now, in the, mean, in the meantime, in Joppa, Peter is staying with a man named Simon who happens to be a tanner by the sea. And it is around noon, it's lunchtime, food is being prepared, Peter is feeling hungry, and he decides to go up on the rooftop to pray. Now this would have been common in those days. Noontime prayers were very common and it was also common to have patios on the roof. So Peter is on the rooftop praying to God and he sees a vision from the Lord. Scripture says that Peter fell into a trance. Look with me at chapter 10, verse 11. In this vision, Peter saw something being let down from the sky like a sheet, something that resembled a sheet, and there were many animals on it. The thing we have to notice is all of the animals on the sheet were unclean animals. There were creeping and crawling things, birds and reptiles and snakes. And Peter heard a voice that told him to go over and kill the animals and eat them for food. And what we want to notice is because of Peter's heritage, he had never eaten anything unclean in all of his life. And so he responds with, by no means, Lord, this was unthinkable for Peter to eat unclean animals. But then God spoke again and God said, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times. And after the third time, the sheet was taken back up into the sky. Now think about this for a minute. What do you think Peter was thinking? Can you imagine how he must have felt trying to figure out what this vision exactly meant? You see, he was a devout Jew. He had never eaten anything unclean. And of course, we would think that this vision had to do with, with dietary restrictions. And Peter was well aware from Leviticus 11, which gives us all the details around what foods Israelites were permitted to eat and which ones were not. For example, Peter would not have been ever allowed to eat pork, so no yummy bacon for him, which makes us really sad, right? I love bacon, I'm sure you do too. He would have never had shrimp and grits or lobster or many of the things that we love today, and I'm sure we're feeling just a little bit sorry for Peter in this moment. But what we see is this vision had nothing to do with dietary restrictions, but it had everything to do with the family of God. God had clearly spoken over Peter three different times. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. God would use this vision to prepare Peter for what was to come. So what happens next? There is a knock at the door. The men from Caesarea have arrived and they are looking for Peter. In chapter 10, verse 19, God spoke to Peter. As Peter was thinking about this vision, God met him with a call to action. So let's think about this for a minute. 
Peter had been on the rooftop praying, seeking the face of God in the presence of God. And God spoke to him and said, there are three men at the door. They are looking for you. And this is what I want you to do. Go downstairs, invite them in, show them great hospitality because I have sent them to you. So what do you think Peter did? He obeyed God. He went downstairs. He invited the men in. Now let's think about this for a minute because these men were Gentiles. Peter never would have invited Gentiles into his home and given them lodging, but that's exactly what he did. Why? Because God told him to do it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, we must allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. Have you ever felt interrupted by God? You know, I think it's really important for us to think about what these small interruptions could look like. Sometimes we may feel that still small voice speaking to us to reach out to a friend that God has put a friend on our hearts that maybe we could give them a call to check on them, to let them know we're thinking about them and praying for them, or maybe to write a note and send it in the mail or send them a text. These small promptings of God are little assignments for us. And so I just want us to be so aware that we too are listening and quick to obey these promptings in our spirit that we feel like are from God. Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. As Jesus followers, we so want to be listening and active listening and cooperating with the Holy Spirit to participate in the mission that God has for us as well. Because just like he had a mission for Peter, he has a mission for me and you. Now, it is important for us to realize that Peter was in a state of prayer. He was seeking God in the presence of God when the Spirit led him. And we, too, want to be in the Word of God, seeking the face of God, and listening for that small voice. Beth Moore says, The answer God gives us in our tomorrows often flow from our faithful todays. And don't we want to be so faithful in all of our todays to be quick to say yes to Jesus? So God has invited Peter in the story that he specifically had planned for him to play, and he is also inviting us into an amazing story. Learning to say yes to God in the small things is the training that we need to be ready to say yes when God calls us to something much bigger. So what happened next? The guys went inside and they began to tell Peter all about what God had spoken to Cornelius and why they had come. And Peter was just beginning to understand what God was asking of him. He was remembering those words, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. Look forward at chapter 11, 14, and it shows us just what type of message this would be, that this truly would be a message of salvation. Peter's message would be the message of the gospel of Jesus. This message would be full of grace and forgiveness and redemption, be being extended to the Gentiles for the very first time. So as we begin study two, we will be looking at Acts chapters 10, 23 through 48, titled The Gentile Pentecost. So the next day, Peter left with the men heading back to Caesarea. There were six men in all, three men from Caesarea, and also three of Peter's own buddies that would be going along with him. And they began to make this 35-mile trek back to the home of Cornelius. Peter obeyed God and did exactly what God was asking him to do. He knew that God was leading him and that God is always at work in our stories. And I love the song that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You're the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And this is who God was for Peter too. What an amazing picture for us today to see and know that the church of Jesus is alive and well. Picking up in Acts chapter 10, 24, back in Caesarea, we see that a crowd is forming. Cornelius is excited and he has gathered all his friends and family that he could invite to come into his home waiting for Peter's arrival. And as Peter arrives in Cornelius' home, Cornelius bows down on the ground and begins to worship him. And Peter says, no, don't do that. I am just a man myself. Get up. You see, Peter had a captive audience in the home of Cornelius. They were waiting to hear this message. The stage was set. Cornelius and the crowd were anxious and waiting to hear every word that Peter was about to share. The Holy Spirit was going to do a brand new thing that would change history forever. 
As Peter begins to share with them, he shares that he knows now that God does not play favorites nor show partiality to the Jews, that from any nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right is welcome to come into the family of God and be accepted as a child of God. In verse 34, Peter begins his sermon, which is a sermon of the gospel, and he shares a powerful message about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he begins with Jesus' baptism in the Jordan by John. He tells them about the voice that was heard there, how Jesus was then empowered by the Spirit of God to go about his ministry, that he had healed many, many people and even cast out demons only because God was with him. And Peter reminded them that he was an eyewitness to many of these things. He shares about the death of Jesus on the cross and how Jesus was paying for every sin that had ever been committed by mankind and how God raised him from the dead on the third day and how he appeared to many people, including the disciples, and they even ate and drank with Jesus. And they were eyewitnesses to all of these things. He told them how Jesus had commanded them to preach the good news to the people and to proclaim that anyone who believes in Jesus will receive forgiveness of all of their sins. Before he can even finish his powerful message, you cannot believe what happened. The Spirit of God was on the move, working and moving in the hearts of people, and their their hearts began to explode in faith in response to this gospel message. They believed and they were born again and their hearts were quickened to life in Jesus. They would never be the same again. You see, they were a new creation at this point. The old had gone and the new had come. And there was great rejoicing and great celebration. They were praising God enthusiastically and they even began speaking in tongues. Now, this is interesting to note because this was confirmation that they too had received the Spirit of God just like at Pentecost. And there was great celebration and great joy. And you can imagine, they too all wanted to be baptized into the name of Jesus, which was an outward sign of an inward cleansing. Salvation had come to the Gentiles. Gentiles had finally been included in the family of God. Think about this. They were no longer outcasts. They were no longer estranged. But now they were brothers and sisters in Christ. Can you even imagine this paradigm shift? But let's not miss that in verse 45, even those believers, Peter's buddy, buddies that had come with him, they were completely amazed and astonished that before their very eyes, the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. And guess what happened next? This story began to spread, as news always does. But this story spread all the way back to Jerusalem, to the church leaders in Jerusalem. So as we begin study three in Acts chapter 11, one through 18, we will see the church's confirmation. Now, as the church hears about these Gentile conversions, you can imagine that they had a lot of questions, but they also were very upset about what they were hearing. They wanted an explanation and they wanted to talk to Peter. This was shocking to their ears to hear that God had granted repentance to Gentiles. So Peter arrives in Jerusalem and he begins to explain to them all the details of what happened on the rooftop in Joppa, of how the men came from Cornelius, of all the things that happened at Cornelius's home. And in chapter 11, verse 15, he explained to them that he preached the message of Jesus and witnessed the Holy Spirit being poured out on the Gentiles just the same as it had at them at Pentecost. He explained that God had given the Gentiles the same gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and who was he to stand in God's way? That's a great point, right? Great question. Can we stop for a minute and just say, praise the Lord. In Jerusalem, they had nothing else to say, and they all began glorifying God and recognizing that God had a plan different than what they ever could have imagined. Remember how God had promised Abraham in Genesis to include all the nations? In the final book of Revelation, it gives us a similar picture. In Revelation 7, 9, we see this revelation that was given to the apostle John. It says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation and tribe and people and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, 
clothed in white robes with branches in their hands. So we pick up the story with study four in Acts chapter 11, verse 19. The gospel goes to Antioch. Now, in the city of Antioch, we know that after the death of Stephen, persecution began to rise up, and as a result, the people were scattered. They were scattered to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And there, they were preaching the good news only to the Jews. And in chapter 11, verse 20, we find that some new guys had come into the city. We don't know exactly who they were, but we do know where they are from. They were from the island of Cyprus and from Cyrene, which is a great a Greek city on the North African coast. These men had come to Antioch, and they were going to have a tremendous impact there. Now, a little bit of history background on the city of Antioch is this. It was the third largest city in the world at that time, next to Rome and Alexandria. But it was known for its pagan worship of the little G god called Daphne. Now, in this city, there was a temple of Daphne there, known for sensuality and depravity. There were temple prostitutes serving in the temple, encouraging everyone along a life of pleasure and sensuality. But these men from Cyprus and Cyrene had come to Antioch, and they had a tremendous zeal and love for Jesus Christ. And they entered this pagan landscape and began to organically preach Jesus, not just with the Jews, but also with Gentiles. And their passion was contagious. Many, many people in Antioch responded in faith. Their passion reminds me of one of my favorite authors, whose name is A.W. Tozer. He is an American pastor and writer, and he too is zealous and passionate for Jesus. He was born in 1897 in Newburgh, Pennsylvania, born into poverty, and he was self-educated. He was a self-educated man who one day was walking along the street and heard a street preacher say, if you don't know how to be saved, just call on God saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And that's exactly what he did. He went home and actually climbed into his attic, got down on his knees and prayed that prayer, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And this began a lifelong pursuit of God in the heart of Tozer. Five years later, without any theological training, he began to pastor his first church. And this would begin 44 years of serving as pastor in a number of American churches. His messages were full of passion, as you can imagine, and he wrote more than 60 books, mostly compiled from his brilliant sermons. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Let's think about that for a minute. What does come into our minds when we think about God? Who is God to us? Is it the same God that we see in the scriptures? Do we see God with a reverence and an awe like the God fears that we have seen today? I certainly hope that we do. Tozer was most well known for his book titled The Pursuit of God, which is also one of my favorites. And in the introduction, he said this, this book is a modest attempt to aid God's hungry children so to find him. Others before me have gone much farther into the holy mysteries than I have done, but if my fire is not large, it is yet very real, and there may be those who can light their candle at its flame. Tozer had experienced God in an amazing, life-transforming way, and he wanted everyone in the world to experience God in this way and choose to follow Jesus Christ. As these zealous men in Antioch came preaching in power, we see in chapter 11, verse 21, that God's hand was upon them and there was a great number who had put their faith in Jesus. You see, they had a bold confidence that was rooted in God and they were a conduit of grace and faith and hope and love to the people of Antioch, which is a beautiful picture of us. And as you would expect, the word did begin to spread and Jerusalem did take notice of all the things that were happening in Antioch. But this time it was different. Jerusalem was very excited and even sent some of their best to the city of Antioch. They sent Barnabas and he was a great man, full of faith and filled with the Holy Spirit. Barnabas was sent there to shepherd the people, to teach them, to help them grow, to shepherd them. And when Barnabas arrived, it was truly amazing. He was completely astonished and he glorified God, but then immediately began teaching them, pouring out loads of encouragement and reminding them that nothing is more important than remaining true to the Lord. Nothing is more important in our lives than our relationship with God through Jesus. 
Barnabas then felt compelled to leave Antioch to go to Tarsus to find Saul and bring him back. So now imagine Barnabas and Saul, two A-level pastors in the city of Antioch. They would spend one year there pouring into the people and building up the church. And this is something really special for us to note. In Antioch, the believers were given a Greek nickname. As we know, the word for Messiah in Greek is Christ. They began to call the Jesus followers Christians for the first time in all of history. Isn't that a neat thing to understand? So we pick up the story in study five, and we will look at chapter 12, starting in verse six. It is titled, A Miraculous Escape, and that is what we are going to see. So this story begins with King Herod at the center of the story, and we find that persecution is continuing. But we want to remember the backstory of this particular Herod. He was the grandson of Herod the Great, who called for the murder of innocent baby boys around the birth of Jesus. His uncle was King Herod Agrippa, who had a hand in sentencing Jesus to death on the cross. This family had an, a heritage of murder and evil intent, and so we won't be surprised to find that King Herod is also in the position of taking lives as well. Now, being a political figure, it may be no great surprise to us that his popularity was of huge importance to him. What made him popular among the people, he would be willing to do. Now, commentary shows us that when Herod was with Romans, he acted like a Roman. But when he was with Jews, he acted like a Jew, although he was Jewish only by race and not by conviction. Now, again, King Herod was most concerned with his likability and popularity. So at this point, we know that King Herod had been mistreating those who belonged to the church. He even had James, the brother of John, put to death. He saw that this pleased the Jews, and so he also had Peter arrested and placed into prison, intending the same fate for Peter. Herod's plan was to bring Peter out after Passover and have him put to death as well, thinking that Peter's death would also greatly please the Jews. But God, can you say, but God, God had a different plan for Peter, and it is going to be a great miracle. Now, what we want to know is that while Peter is in prison, there were four squads of guards watching over him. This was to ensure that there would be no way for Peter to escape. And the church, what is the church doing? You can imagine that they were in turmoil and in great distress over Peter being in prison. And so they were gathered together on their knees, praying and begging God to protect Peter. But that very night, a miracle happened. As Peter was chained to guards and sleeping, an angel of the Lord came and stood beside Peter. The angel struck Peter on the side and said, Peter, get up, get on your clothes. It's time for us to go. And as soon as Peter stood up, his chains all fell off. And he began to walk past the guards, the first guards and the second guards. And he couldn't tell if he was dreaming or if this really was real. And then they came to the city gate. You won't believe this. The city gate swung open all by itself. And at this moment, the angel disappeared. Peter realized this is very real. This is not a dream. This has actually happened. God had sent an angel to rescue Peter from the prison cell and all that King Herod had thought to do to Peter. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt? He knew that God had rescued him from the hand of Herod. I'm sure he was so excited, so elated, couldn't believe it himself. And from this gift of escape, Peter would continue on his mission as if nothing had happened, with his eyes fixed on Jesus, preaching and teaching the people about the good news and the gospel of Jesus Christ. As long as Peter had breath in his lungs, it was his mission to live his life fully proclaiming the gospel. Now, Herod probably thought that he was going to put a stop to one of the world's greatest preachers in those days. But what Herod did not realize is you cannot stop an unstoppable God. That is who our God is. In case you may be wondering what happened to King Herod after this, he had a most unfortunate end. He was spending some time in Caesarea and on a certain day he was seated in his royal robes and he began to address the crowds and the people began praising King Herod. They were saying that he was a God and not a man. 
and an angel of the Lord stepped in and struck King Herod dead on the spot. But it gets much worse than this. This was not the end. Herod was then devoured by worms, scripture says. You see, Herod was always about his own glory. He had nothing in his heart that wanted to give glory to God, and he continually stood in opposition to Jesus, and this great judgment fell upon him because he refused to give glory to God. And so we come to the end of chapter 12, and it feels a little bit like a full circle moment. The church is growing in power, and in chapter 12, 24, we see that the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. The church today, over 2,000 years later, is still growing and thriving. God is still at work today, and it's an amazing thing for us to see. The church will never be stopped, never. This past New Year's Eve was an over-the-top experience for our family. On New Year's Eve, we met at Mercedes-Benz Arena in Atlanta with 65,000 college students who said, there is nothing more important then ringing in the new year, worshiping and praising Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And as we looked around that stadium and saw all of those students with their hands lifted high, worshiping and praising Jesus, we know that they will carry this banner of Jesus and the gospel back to their college campuses and be a light there. I want us to see that even with the youth, the church is still alive and well today and growing stronger. Their anthem and our anthem is Isaiah 26, 8. It says, yes, Lord, walking in the way of your laws, we wait for you. Your name and your renown are the desire of our souls. What an amazing picture for us today to see and know that the church of Jesus is alive and well, even with our youth today. And just like the early church, as we saw in Acts 9, 31, the church today is going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now, three important things that I want us to remember as we close about what we've learned today. One, Peter trusted God's plan even when he didn't fully understand it. What about us? Do we fully trust God with our circumstances even when we can't exactly see what's going to happen with them? Are we on our knees begging God and trusting him knowing that he is the one in control just like Peter did? Number two, Peter saw the miracles and ministry of Jesus firsthand, and it forever changed all of who he was. Have we too been completely changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ and hold it as the most important thing in our lives? Number three, Peter gave his life away to make this good news known because he knew that there was no decision in the world more important than choosing to follow Jesus no decision more important. And so he shared with all of the people he came in contact with the message and the gospel of goodness and grace. Have you given your life away? In what ways would your family and friends say, I know that they are a Jesus follower and they are serious about their faith. I pray that it would be so evident in all of our lives, all of our days that people would see Jesus in us, that we truly would be a light that shines in this dark world and shines bright for Jesus. So we say, yes, Lord, your name and your renown is the desire of our souls.